If you've done any coding in Python, you've probably used a number in one of your programs. Maybe you used an integer to specify the index of a value in a list. But there's actually a whole lot more to numbers in Python than meets the eye. Let's take a look at three things about numbers in Python that you might not be aware of. Pretty much everything in Python is an object. And one of the first objects that a lot of people learn about is the stir object, which is used to represent strings. Maybe you've seen how strings have methods, like the upper method, which returns a new string containing all uppercase characters. Just like strings, numbers in Python are also objects and have their own methods. For instance, you can convert an integer, say n equals 255, to a byte string using the toBytes method. The length parameter specifies the number of bytes to use in the byte string, and the byte order parameter determines the order of the bytes. For example, setting byte order to big returns a byte string with the most significant byte first. And setting byte order to little puts the least significant byte first. 255 is the largest number that can be represented as an 8-bit integer. So you can set length equals one in the two bytes method with no problem. If you set length equals one in two bytes for the number 256, however, you'll get an overflow error. You can even convert a byte string to an integer using the from bytes class method. Class methods are called from a class name instead of a class instance, which is why the from bytes method is called on int here. Floating point numbers also have methods. Perhaps the most useful method for floats is isInteger, which is used to check whether or not a float has no fractional part. For example, if n is equal to 2.0, then n.isInteger returns true, because 2.0 has no fractional part. But if n is equal to 3.14, then n.isInteger returns false, because 3.14 has the fractional part 0.14. One interesting float method is the as integer ratio method, which returns a tuple containing the numerator and denominator of the fraction representing the floating point value. So if n is equal to 0.5, then n dot as integer ratio returns a tuple one comma two. Thanks to floating point representation error though, this method can return some pretty unexpected results. So that probably looks pretty weird. The reason this happens is that floating point numbers get stored on computers as binary decimals. And since computers only have finite memory, there can only be a finite number of decimal places in the binary decimal. You might recall that some fractions, like one third, can't be represented as a finite decimal. One third is equal to 0 0.333 repeating. There's an infinite number of threes after the decimal point. The same thing happens to 0.1 when you represent it as a binary fraction. To make up for this, floating point numbers get stored as the nearest finite binary decimal to whatever number you're trying to represent. So if you take this really large numerator and divide it by this really large denominator, you'll get some number that's really close to 0.1, but not exactly equal to it. And this isn't something that's specific to Python, by the way. The same thing will happen with any programming language that implements what's known as the IEEE 754 floating point standard. This error between the actual value that you want and the value of the floating point number that gets stored in memory is called floating point representation error. And it's the root of pretty much everything that can make working with floats difficult. If you need to, you can call number methods on number literals by surrounding the literals with parentheses. For example, I can call the isInteger method on the floating point literal 3.14 by surrounding 3.14 with these parentheses. Actually, you don't have to do that with floats. Leaving the parentheses off will work just fine, but you do have to do it with integers. So if I call the two bytes number on the integer literal 255 and don't surround 255 with parentheses, I'll get a syntax error. But if I do put parentheses around it, there's no problem. In mathematics, numbers have a natural hierarchy. For example, all natural numbers are integers. All integers are rational numbers. All rational numbers are real numbers. 
and all real numbers are complex numbers. The same thing is true for numbers in Python. This numeric tower is expressed through abstract types contained in the numbers module. Every number in Python is an instance of the number class, which I can import from the numbers module. So for example, I could check that the integer 1729 is an instance of the number class, and that's true. It's also true for a float like 3.14, and even for complex numbers like 1j. In fact, if you need to check if a value is numeric, but you don't care what kind of number it is, this is a good way to do it. In addition to the number class, Python has four additional abstract types that make up the numeric tower, and all of them live inside of the numbers module. The most general one is the complex class. The complex class is used to represent complex numbers, and there's one built-in concrete complex type that is complex, but with a lowercase c. The next most general abstract type is the real class. Real is a subclass of complex. And there's one built-in concrete real type, float. Next is the rational class. The rational class is used to represent rational numbers like fractions. There's one built-in concrete rational type that is the fraction class from the fractions module. And you can check that fraction is in fact a subclass of rational. Finally, there's the integral class. Integral is used to represent integers. Unlike complex, real, and rational, integral actually has two concrete built-in types that implement it. There's int, and also bool. That's right, Boolean values are numbers. In fact, bool is a direct subclass of the int class. There are two Boolean literals in Python, true, which is actually equal to one, and false, which is equal to zero. So this has some pretty weird implications. For example, you can do arithmetic with Booleans. True plus one is equal to two, and true plus false is equal to one. There's some even weirder stuff that you can do with Booleans. Let's say I have a list of numbers, one, two, three, and four. I can actually get the first element in the nums list using false as the index. And I can get the second element from the nums list using true as the index. I don't recommend you do this in your own code. Since false is equal to zero, if you divide something by false, you get a zero division error. But did you notice something a little off about the concrete types I mentioned that implement the abstract number types in the numbers module? We had the complex type with a lowercase c, which implements the complex abstract type with a capital C. We had the float type, which implements the real abstract type. The fraction type, which implements the rational abstract type. And int and bool, which both implement the integral abstract type. There's a concrete number type in Python that is missing there though, and that's decimal. So the decimal class is used to exactly represent decimal numbers and overcome the limitations of floating point arithmetic. So they're kind of like floats, except they're exact. They're not subject to floating point representation error. Since floats implement the real abstract type, you'd kind of expect decimal to implement real as well, but it actually doesn't. All right, but decimals are kind of like floats, right? So you'd think that they'd also be a subclass of complex. After all, float is a subclass of complex. But decimal isn't even a subclass of complex.
it is a subclass of number, but it doesn't fit in anywhere else in the number hierarchy. I find that kind of weird. So I did some digging to try and understand what's going on. And it turns out there's a comment in the CPython source code for the decimal class that explains exactly what's going on. It says decimal has all of the methods specified by the real abstract base class, but it should not be registered as a real because decimals do not interoperate with binary floats. For example, if you try to add the decimal 3.14 to the float 2.71828, this operation is undefined. You can't add decimals and floats together, but abstract real numbers should interoperate. So if you have some real number R1 and another real number R2, you should be able to add those together. But you can't add a decimal with a float because floats are imprecise, decimals are exact. So there's no good way to know what you should do if you try to add two instances of those classes together. This idea that two types that both implement the same abstract interface should interoperate with each other is called the Liskov substitution principle. And it's an important idea in object-oriented programming. There's nothing stopping the Python developers from registering decimal as a real, but if they did, it would violate the Liskov substitution principle. The third and final thing that you may not know about numbers in Python is that they're extensible. In other words, you can use Python's abstract numeric base types to create your own abstract and concrete numeric types. For example, here's a custom real number type I've created called extended int. So an extended integer is a real number that has this form, a plus b times the square root of p. Here, a, b, and p are all integers, but since we're taking the square root of p, the resulting number could potentially be a real number, especially if p is not a perfect square, like two or three or something like that. So because this inherits from numbers.real, I need to implement the entire real interface. And there's a lot that you have to do. So if I just scroll through here and show you, I have some normal things like the dunder wrapper and dunder stir methods for printing out what this number will look like. And I've used the little square root symbol here in the dunder stir. So when this gets printed as a string, it'll have a nice looking format. But there's all sorts of other things that I need to implement here. For example, I need a dunder trunk method, which is used for truncating the number. In this case, I just pass the val. So if I go back up and show you the attributes that I have in the class, I have this underscore val attribute that is the actual value of the number. And by the way, this will be a floating point type here. But to implement the dunder trunk method, I take that underscore val attribute and pass it to the int class. I need a dunder float method. Of course, I need a dunder hash method and all sorts of other things here. There are a lot of them. So I won't go into all the details of the implementation because it's really not that important. I don't think many people are going to be implementing their own number types. Really, I just wanted to show you that there's a lot that has to be done. And in some cases, you have to be really careful about how your number type that you're implementing interoperates with other number types. So for example, my dunder add method, which gets called whenever you use the plus operator with an instance of the extended integer type and some other number, then you have to do all sorts of checks to see, okay, well, what type is the other number and how should it be handled? So if in this case, both instances have the same p value, then I'm going to return a new extended integer instance, but otherwise I'm going to return a float. And if the other number that's being added to my extended integer instance is an integral type, I'm going to add that other value to my a value, so the a attribute, and then return a new extended integer type. So I have to create all these rules for you know, how it interoperates with other number types and make sure that everything behaves the way it's supposed to. Like I said, there are a lot of things that you have to implement, and these are required. If you go through the real abstract base class, you'll see every single one of these needs to be there. Otherwise, Python won't even let you subclass from it. And just to show you that this does actually work, let me open my Python REPL. So let me go ahead and import the extended integer type. And I'll create a new extended integer instance. I'll assign that to a variable called n. And I'll let the A value be one, the B value be two, and let's set the P value to three. So if I take a look at N, then this is what I had for the wrapper. So it just prints the class name, extended integer, and the values that were used to instantiate that instance. 
But if I print n and take a look at the string, then I get that nice little printed version that I had there before. And all the arithmetic operations work with it. So I could add one to n and you'll see that the a value has been increased by one. I can multiply n by a number. And here my a and b values have both been multiplied by two. So this new extended integer instance has a equal to two, b equal to four, but the p value has stayed the same. I can even cast this to a floating point number. So I'll type float n and it will actually calculate what the floating point value of that number is. And then just to show you that extended integer actually fits into Python's numeric hierarchy, I'll import from the numbers module the number class and also the real class. And let's go ahead and import the complex and rational classes as well. So I can check that n, the extended integer number that I have, is in fact a number. And it should be because I inherited from the real class. And that's true. Of course, it's also an instance of real. It's also an instance of complex. And that's because by inheriting from the real class, I've put this extended integer type into Python's numeric hierarchy. So it fits in exactly the way it should. And that includes things like not being an instance of the rational class. So Python's number hierarchy is really flexible, but you do need to take great care when implementing types derived from built-in abstract based types. You need to make sure that they play well with others. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the decimal type, which does not inherit from real. If you do find yourself in a situation where you need to implement a custom number type, there are actually several tips in the Python docs for type implementers that you should probably take a look at. And I also think it's a good idea to check out Python's fraction implementation. You can see exactly how a quote unquote custom number type was implemented in CPython using the abstract numeric base types. So there you have it, three things and maybe a whole lot more that you may not have known about numbers in Python. We saw that numbers have methods like the two bytes integer method and the is integer float method. We saw that numbers have a hierarchy and talked about five different abstract base classes, number, complex, real, rational, and integral. And finally, you saw that numbers are extensible. You can create your own custom number types. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned something new.